Russian figure skating doping scandal part one. First things first, I need to dispel a few myths. The first thing that you need to understand is that figure skating is not fair. It's not fair. It's just not. I don't really even know if anyone ever claimed that it was fair. And a lot of the conversation around the Russian doping scandal right now is that the use of these drugs has somehow made the level playing field unlevel. It was never level. That didn't happen. So let's just move on from that myth because it's really soiling the conversation in a tacky way. Yes, all the skaters are judged by the same criteria, but they come into the competition from such a wide range of backgrounds, you can hardly expect anything to be fair, especially when you know that there's pretty large discrepancies between the amount of funding and social support that a lot of these athletes get. The fact that we're judging someone like Nathan Chen, who's taking time off from an Ivy League school against Donovan Carrillo, who trains in Guadalajara in a shopping mall, really just highlights the inequity that already exists in this sport. And I want to give figure skating credit. We've come a long way and we're working on these things together as a community, but we still have a long way to go. And what's happening right now at the games is really indicative of some of that. Another thing that we really need to keep in mind is that the Olympics are not for kids. They're not for children. And I know that's hard for us to keep in mind because some of these athletes, especially in sports like figure skating and gymnastics, they're young and they're small. They're 15 year old girls. They're prepubescent little kids who are doing these amazing feats. But the games are not for them. They weren't designed for them and they're not being governed by them. And the idea that it should be our number one priority to protect those kids is a little bit messed up. Uh, if you're gonna play the game, you need to know the rules and you need to play along by those rules. So the idea that somebody is protected from punishment when they break the rules just because they're a minor would also suggest that they would not be appropriate to participate in these events. Plainly put, if Camilla Valieva can't be held accountable for her participation in whatever level of doping occurred, then she probably shouldn't be competing in the games at all. I know a lot of people are saying things like, she may not have known that she was being drugged, but at this stage of the game, you're at the Olympics, and you do need to take some level of personal responsibility for what's happening to you. And if you are trusting other people, like your coach or your federation, to make those decisions on your behalf, then you also need to be responsible for what happens as a result of those decisions and that trust. And it looks like I'm running out of time, so this is going to go on to part two. Okay, so let's talk about Camila Valieva. Uh, somehow in the last 24 hours, we've all learned that at some point in December, she failed a drug test. I don't know at this point who administered the drug test, who had the results, where the results were stored, how they were publicized, or why we're only getting them now if the test was taken in December. I believe that test would have also had taken place before the Russian nationals. So what I don't understand from that particular piece of this is that if the Russian Federation knew that she had a positive p-test, why did they send her to the Olympics? It's not like we don't have a really deep Russian team. They could have sent another athlete and would probably still have swept the entire podium. The reality is that the Russian ladies are gifted. They are unbelievable. They are doing things that we've never seen athletes do before, certainly not women. And they're all doing it at like 16 years old. They're so young and so incredibly talented. So this does raise a lot of eyebrows, and we do have to kind of look at what the impact of performing enhancing drugs could do to a figure skater. Now, I have argued for years that performance enhancing drugs don't really help out figure skaters, and I think we need to be a little bit more clear about that. Taking something like an anabolic steroid isn't going to help a skater. However, Taking a performance enhancing drug that does something like regulate your metabolism or control the amount of oxygen in your blood that's going to your heart, those types of things will help you, but they have to be taken for a long period of time. For an example, if you are taking something that allows your heart to regulate differently, it will allow you to train harder and longer for a long period of time. Now, in competition, your programs like four minutes, four and a half minutes, it it's the same no matter what. So just trying to get through those four minutes is not why you take the drugs. 
The drugs are taken so that you can train harder and longer over a longer period of time and build the skills. And one of the reasons why the Russian athletes are so interesting is because they are so young. They have not had time in their lives to develop the type of career ending injuries that most skaters walk away from the sport with. That's just the reality. And even at their young age, a lot of them are dealing with some pretty bad physical issues, whether it be bone bruises or back problems, small fractures. We're going to hear a lot about these things. So just know that the drugs that have been taken, we're not dealing with the regular day-to-day -day injuries. It had to do with the training and the long-term training. So what I think we all need to shift our focus on is what does that training look like for some of these athletes and who is in control of that? And another thing to keep in mind is that everybody knows what they're doing. No one was lied to. If a teenager took a pill or had their water bottle dosed or something, they knew about it. Even if it was something that they were not doing, they were complicit in that because they're willing to train with the coaches who are allowing for that to happen. Part three, she's still going. Okay, let's talk about this coach. So, Terry Tootkoberitz, Tootkoberitz, I can't say it, so we're just gonna call her Terry or Scary Terry. This is the Bella Caroli of figure skating, and yes, we should be very scared of her. She is absolutely the best of the best. She trains the best of the best. The last two ladies Olympic figure skating gold medalists trained under her, and I believe the silver medalist did too. All of her skaters are performing better jumps, beautiful programs at younger ages than anyone else in the world. She's the best. There's just no argument. But in order to get to that place and to be the best. You do have to color outside the lines and do some things that would probably shock a lot of people. Terry's students live full-time in training camps that are state-sponsored. So she's being paid not by the skaters themselves, but actually by the Russian government, specifically to produce skaters. And she's really good at it. She's doing a good job. But when you are accountable to an entity such as Russia, you got a, a lot of pressure on your back. So I fully understand why Terry might go about training and preparing some of these athletes in a way that might be considered a little sketchy. Okay, let's just say it. Abusive. That's a thing. But another thing to keep in mind is that this is not the Soviet sports machine. No one's being forced to do this. If you don't want to be an Olympic figure skater, no one's holding a gun to your head and saying, you have to train, you have to work hard, you have to live away from your family. These are decisions that are made along the way, and that's just part of the game. You'll find this type of culture is really prevalent in aesthetic sports, things like figure skating and cheerleading. It's not uncommon to have skaters move away from home into full-time training environments. And as one of the skaters who never did that, I have to say I was jealous. And part of me does feel like, you know, I wish someone believed in me enough to give me performance enhancing drugs, but that didn't happen. Even so, the things that I was willing to do and the lengths that I was willing to go to just to be as bad, you know, as, as good as I could in my own figure skating space, I wouldn't let most kids do the things that I did and I wouldn't recommend it to most people. And now as a mom, I'm looking at buying my son his first pair of skates and honestly wondering if I want to open up that Pandora's box. But that being said, my son is also not going to a Russian figure skating camp to train for the Olympics. We're not doing that. However, I'm not going to judge the decisions of these families and coaches and skaters who have made the choice to sacrifice their normal teenage experience so that they can be Olympians, because that's cool too. Part four, she's still going. Figure skating does not exist in a vacuum. Sports don't exist in a vacuum, so things like law and rules and culture and values and economies will impact what's happening, especially at the level of the Olympic Games. The idea that this is somehow supposed to be some sort of squeaky clean situation without uh, any sort of performance enhancements or national interest at stake is short-sighted and naive. The reality of this situation is that this is huge. The Olympic figure skating event is easily one of the single biggest cultural events that exist in Russia. And it's the opportunity for them to really showcase what they do best. There really is no one better than these girls and these jumps and these programs. They are absolutely breathtaking. And if you don't believe me, go find a YouTube video. They're all out there. But while you're watching these feats of athletic accomplishment, you have to keep in mind, these are not regular teenagers. These are professional, 
full-time elite athletes who've made very conscientious decisions to give up things like adolescence so that they could have this experience. All figure skaters make these decisions. A lot of athletes make these decisions, especially athletes in the aesthetic sports. It's just what we do. But we all need to stop having this whole mentality that she's a victim. Yeah, she's been victimized, but I can't help but ask if she's being victimized by Russia or her coach or by the culture of sports and what we are doing to each other within this culture. The win at all cost mentality does make sense at this stage of the game because these skaters have given up so much to get where they're at. I'm not saying that they should apply to the way that we all live our lives or the way that our kids play in Little League. That's not cool. That's not sportsmanship and that's definitely not the spirit of the games. But that is absolutely the spirit of elite Olympic figure skating, and to pretend it's not is short-sighted and naive. This is simply the way the game is played at this level, and I'm not defending it, but I think we need to acknowledge that that's the truth about this situation. So who's to blame? Who's going to get punished for this? Because right now, there's a teenager who's worked their entire life towards this moment only to be made into a villain for behavior that she may or may not have fully been aware of. Do we blame the coaches for whatever their role is in this? Do we blame her parents for not protecting her? Or do we need to take a step back and really blame society and ourselves as athletes and fans for creating a culture that has allowed this type of thing to happen. I'd personally like to point a finger of blame at the governing bodies who facilitate the games and organize the sports. Between the ISU, the IOC, the USFSA, the Russian Federation, and the uh, anti-doping, world anti-doping, the WADA people, the, the anti-doping people, basically there's no two organizations that have the exact same sets of rules. So one problem that we're having is that the age level for figure skating is 16, but the age of culpability within the anti-doping organization's rules is 18, which is why they're now discussing this as a legal issue as opposed to just an athletic issue or an Olympic issue. So let's all take a long, sober look at the games and sports in general. The role of sports in the human experience is a game. It's something that is done in sport and it's supposed to be fun. And I understand that the Olympics have come to mean a great deal more, but what we're all willing to do to sacrifice in the name of achievement has become a little bit ridiculous. As the situation continues to develop and we get more information, I'll check back in with everyone and provide whatever sort of feedback I can, but I really think that this is a good point uh, for us to pause and look at the relationship that we have with sports and what they've done to us socially. And I, I really hope at some point somebody facilitates a conversation between Camilla Velieva and someone who can help her out and help her understand what's going on here and what's at stake and help her make better decisions in the future. And I personally would like to nominate Simone Biles to have that conversation. I think that she's the person who uh, can most effectively lead us towards a, a better resolution as we sort of redefine what this is and then work collectively to help the Olympics mean something again, because if not, like, what's the fucking point? <sighs>